Chapter Twenty One of Two Years in Oregon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Two Years in Oregon by Wallace Nash. Chapter Twenty One. Southern Oregon is defined generally as bounded on the west by the Pacific and starting from its western boundary is bounded on the north by the Kalapuya mountains shutting in the umpqua valley and then running eastward taking in the lake country in this division are included the western counties of douglas coos curry josephine jackson lake and the southern half of grant and baker a great portion of the last named counties is yet unsurveyed the western counties already possess according to the census of 1880 a population of twenty nine thousand eighty one souls the portions of grant and baker counties properly belonging to southern oregon have only about two thousand people the reason being that this country is truly inaccessible being so far distant from the seaboard and hardly traversed by a road southern oregon possesses several rivers and their attendant seaports the most southerly is the rogue river which has a course of about one hundred miles running through a very fertile but secluded valley. The bar at the entrance is shifting, and the channel very variable, but it is entered by both small steamers and by coasting schooners which ply along the coast, with San Francisco as their port of delivery. Goose Bay, some sixty miles to the north of the Rogue River, needs a fuller description, as it is the headquarters of the coal and lumber business of southern Oregon. Detailed reports of the coal basin give not less than 75,000 acres of coal-bearing land estimated to produce from the one vein at present worked not less than four hundred and fifty million tons of coal as many as six workable seams are however known to exist including one which has been prospected to eleven feet in thickness five coal mines have been opened which are capable of producing about two thousand tons of coal daily the working of these mines is of an inexpensive character much of the mineral being accessible from adits or galleries delivering their produce on the hillsides the lumber shipped at coos bay is yielded by four large steam sawmills with an aggregate capacity of about one hundred and fifteen thousand feet per day there are also four shipyards from which between forty and fifty vessels have been launched even up to two thousand tons burden the value of coal and lumber exported from coos bay was upward of four hundred forty five thousand dollars in the year eighteen seventy seven according to the statistics collected by a committee of residents when application was about to be made to congress for an appropriation for the improvement of the harbor it was then reported that a railroad was found to be practicable from coos bay along the coquille valley across the coast mountains such a line would then pass through the umpqua valley to roseburg with a practicable extension up the north fork of the umpqua river and through the cascade mountains into eastern oregon it was ascertained that the chief difficulty in improving the entrance to the port lay in the enormous quantity of movable and shifting sand driven along the coast southward by the prevalent summer northwest winds and then returned by the winter southwest gales so violent is this action that it is thus described large tracts to the north of coos bay and along the rock separating its lower part from the sea where once stood farms and pine forests are now buried to the tops of the highest trees immense quantities of this wind-borne sand are constantly going into the bay and by its swift currents are carried out to form the bar or to be deposited in the bight to the east and north of the cape let me quote a short description of this section of the country on which before many years the tide of immigration must roll in the writer is the hon b herman who is doing all in his power to draw public attention to his district ten mile and camas valleys being respectively ten and fifteen to twenty-five miles from the terminus of the oregon and california railroad at roseburg are without any other outlet the cost of teaming to this point added to the present exorbitant rates of railway freights discourages the farmers of those sections in the cultivation of the soil and yet some of the best and most extensive wheat fields of the country are within those circuits while a vast area is left annually to grow brush and weeds and to remain of comparatively little value 
which should otherwise contribute to the harvest of thousands of bushels of the finest grain. From Camus Valley and along the middle fork of the Colquill River, until its junction with the main stream is reached, a distance of 28 miles by survey, three-fourths of the route is without even a wagon road communication, travel being by trail with ox and sled, saddle and pack horse, and yet there is found a goodly population, having substantial improvements, some very good farms and cultivation, with flowering mills for the local accommodation. The land is very fertile, and capable of growing the usual cereals and esculents of to perfection. But owing to the great difficulty of transporting the productions to market, a very small portion only is cultivated, and much remains vacant, subject to homestead and preemption. From the junction with the main river, and following the latter to near Beaver Slough or Coquille City, the point of diversion of the route toward Coos Bay, an enterprising community is found, owning bottom lands of rich alluvial soil, a great portion of which is now being cleared of timber, annually placed under cultivation, and large crops of grain garnered. This same remark applies to all the remaining portion of the main Coquille Valley, a distance of forty miles or more to the sea, and also along the north and south forks, as well as the smaller tributaries. For a distance of 75 miles inland, the Coquille Valley is capable of extensive agricultural development. Already this distance is closely peopled, all lands on the main stream settled, and improvements slowly made. Much grain is now grown here, a large portion manufactured into flour by the various mills for home consumption, and shipment to Coos Bay, while a considerable quantity of the grain is exported to San Francisco through the mouth of the river. Owing, however, to the condition of the Coquille entrance, only small ships venture in, and even they are often delayed in the river for months at a time, with the shipper's cargo on board. Thus a hopeful people of this extensive and unrivaled valley, for its soil, its productions, its coals, timber, and other abundant natural resources, are virtually left without an exit to the markets of the world. The cost on each bushel of wheat for transportation to Portland from any point in the Umpqua Valley is 23 cents, to say nothing of the added expense of 110 miles to Astoria, thence by sea to San Francisco and elsewhere. From Roseburg to San Francisco by way of Portland and Astoria is about 875 miles, and from Roseburg to San Francisco by the way of Coos Bay is only 465 miles. Dr. James Dillard, as we are credibly informed, produced last year on his farm in Douglas County about 6,000 bushels of grain. To have transported this only to Portland on its way to market would have cost him $1,380. The saving in transportation to Coos Bay by 85 miles of narrow gauge road would be to this one farmer one year's crop $780. No wonder that in this district, as in all others in the state, the transportation question should be the burning one of the day. The Coos Bay people succeeded in gaining the ear of Congress, and two years ago an appropriation of $60,000 was made for the improvement of the harbor. The problem was a very difficult one for the engineer to solve, from the conditions above stated of the driven and shifting sand. It would not have been strange if the work's first plan had needed alterations as they progressed. But the success of the breakwater constructed by the United States engineers from cheap material available on the spot has been sufficiently marked to encourage the request for further appropriations until the plans are executed in their entirety and the opening of the harbor carried still farther out to sea. It is reported now, in the spring of 1881, that the north sand spit is being cut through by the current in the direction indicated by the lines of the breakwater, and that deeper and more constant water is found than heretofore, a good augury of success for similar works where the obstructions are not so shifting as sand alone, and where they are free from the influence of the sand tracks to the north, whence so much of the obstruction to Coos Bay entrance came. And this is our happy case at Wakina. The Umpqua River is the largest river that, rising in the Cascades and draining a large and fertile valley in its course, flows directly into the Pacific after cutting its channel through the coast range. There is a wide and very shifting bar at its mouth, through which the usual channel gives twelve or thirteen feet at low water. The river is navigable for all vessels which can cross the bar as far as Gardner City, five miles from the mouth, 
while smaller vessels can get as far as Scottsburg, 25 miles up. Douglas County, now possessing a population of 9,596, is capable of sustaining a vastly increased number. It lies almost surrounded by mountains, but with a good outlet to the north along the valley lands through which the Oregon and California Railroad runs. It is well watered throughout by the Umpqua and its tributaries, while the northern portion of the county forms the head of the great Willamette, the aggregate of many creeks and streams having here their rise. The climate of Jackson County is a good deal warmer than its mere geographical relations to the counties of the north and east of it would account for. Indian corn is a staple crop, and peaches and vines flourish exceedingly. The sun seems to have more power, and I have a vivid remembrance of heat and dust along its roads. Lake County is well named. Huge depressions in the land are filled with the upper and lower Klamath Lakes, the latter crossing the California boundary line. North of the upper Klamath Lake, again some twenty miles, is the Klamath Marsh, doubtless not long since another lake, now in summer the feeding ground for cattle, in winter the home of innumerable flocks of migratory birds. Between the upper and lower Klamath Lakes runs a rapid watercourse. The town of Linkville stands on its banks. I am told that there is water power here, enough to, to drive as many mills as are found at Lowell, Massachusetts. At Linkville is the land office for Southern Oregon. It has been proposed to run the California extension of the Oregon and California Railroad through the gap between Upper and Lower Klamath Lakes. Should that long-talked-of project ever be realized, the manufacturing facilities of this splendid water power will no longer be suffered to lie dead. Passing eastward, the Great Klamath Indian Reservation is reached, a tract I only know by hearsay as a land of hills and streams, of gullies and watercourses, of lava beds, and barrenness intermixed with quiet vales and dells of wondrous beauty, a land where Indian superstitions cluster thickly. The Indians are few and scattered, and this country, no doubt, ere long will be thrown open to the white traveler and hunter, to be quickly followed by the herdsman and the settler. The great snowy pyramids of the southern Cascades stand on guard. Mount Scott, 8,500 feet. Mount Pitt, 9,250, and Mount Tilson, 9,250, are placed there, 30 miles apart, forbidding passage between the warm valleys of Jackson County and the open plains east of the mountains. But here, too, the hardy pioneers have found their way. I have talked with several men who are herding sheep and cattle on these plains. The merino thrives here even better than in northern Oregon, and many thousand pounds of wool are raised. They describe the country as one of open plain and rocky hillside, of scarce water and abundant sagebrush, resembling in general features the tract fifty miles to the north, but alas, containing scarcely any of the creeks and streams which give life and fertility to Middle Oregon. Eastward again of Stein Mountains, you strike the headwaters of the Owahi, an important tributary of the Snake and at once recur the common features of fertility and consequent settlement, and thus the Idaho boundary is reached. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22, Part 1 of Two Years in Oregon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Kumanov Two Years in Oregon by Wallace Nash Chapter 22, Part 1 Having said so much about the country, something needs to be said about the towns. All persons reaching Oregon, save those few who choose to face the three nights and two days of staging that divide Reading, the northern terminus of the California and Oregon Railroad, from Roseburg, the southern terminus of the Oregon and California Railroad. Enter Oregon by ship from San Francisco. And here, in passing, a word of praise for the really beautiful and commodious steamers, which have now replaced the Ajax and the other monsters which disgraced the traffic they were furnished for, as well as their owners. No better boats ply on any waters than the state of California, the Columbia, and the Oregon. 
The first two are new ships, with electric lights and all other appliances to match. All are safe and speedy. The state of California belongs to the Pacific Coast Steamship Company, the others to the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company. The approach to Oregon is forbidding and stern. There is nothing attractive in the sandy coast, in the muddy water, in the broken but not romantic scenery, where the water is encroaching on the land and shifting its position and attack from time to time. Here and there, along the edge, are strewed, or stand in various attitudes of death, the skeletons of the pine trees, which look like the relics of battle, the perishing remains of the beaten defenders of the coast. And, once over the bar, that terror to sea-worn travelers, the approach to Astoria can hardly be called beautiful. But the city of Astoria itself has claims to beauty of position. It lies within the course of the Columbia, though here the estuary is so wide as to give the idea of a lake. Jutting out into the bay above the town rises a little promontory crowned with firs, and between the eye rests on the unfamiliar outlines of a large cannery, the buildings of gray wood based on piles sunk into the mud of the bay, and the long shingled roofs catching the rays of the departing sun. The city consists of a mass of wooden structures low down by the water's edge, wharves and docks and repairing yards in front, and a long line of stores and saloons and business houses behind, broken by the more imposing custom house, post office, and churches. On the slopes of the high hills, rising from near the water's edge, are the scattered white houses of the inhabitants, while the skyline of the hills is broken through by the cutting by which many tons of stone and sand are being piled into the bay. The city proper mainly stands on piles, the water gurgling and lapping round the barnacles, which cluster thick. The enterprise of the people is fast filling in underneath from the hills behind. There are large and substantial docks of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company, and others adjoining, where are generally lying two or three large ships or barks going out or returning from their long and weary voyage. The atmosphere of the place in the salmon season is fishy, huge stacks of boxed salmon filling the wharves. The principal street is fringed with saloons, mainly looking for custom to the fishermen and seamen. There is a large lumber mill, which makes the air resonant with the shriek of the great saws, and a boot and shoe factory has been recently established. Other industries exist, but it is as a seaport that Astoria justifies its existence and the foresight of its founders. Clatsop County has 7,200 inhabitants, of which, I suppose, Astoria claims a third. There is an air of business and life about the place, and there will be, so far as I can see, even though means should be found of ending the present practice of all large ships going to sea from Portland being towed to Astoria and followed by scows and barges, there to complete their loading for their outward voyage. A similar necessity exists for incoming ships to stay at Astoria, to discharge a large portion of their cargo, before facing the shallows and mud banks of the Willamette on the way to Portland as their port of discharge. The voyage up the Columbia for a hundred miles, and up the Willamette for twelve to Portland, has many charms. First, the grand stream of the mighty Columbia, telling in its size and volume of the 3,000 miles some of its waters have come from their far-off sources among distant mountains. Then the banks, rising generally sheer from the water's edge, crowned with rich and varied vegetation, and here and there the rugged rocks breaking through to give clearness and strength to outline, and then on either side the more distant hills, clothed with a dark fir timber to their summits, and behind the mountains proper, with Mount Hood and Mount St. Helens showing their snowy heads. Here and there, in a niche or angle under the bank, lie huddled close the buildings of a cannery, the blue smoke rising from the central chimney, and the white boats tied to the piling, which juts out into the deep water of the river." you are hardly conscious of leaving the Columbia for the Willamette. It looks as if it were an island in midstream, 
behind and to the south of which you are about to pass. But soon you find that the supposed island is the opposite bank of the Willamette, and passing beacons and marks set to define the channel with the accuracy that is absolutely needed. Since a shear to the east or west of only a yard or two would leave you fast in a mud bank for hours. You come in sight of Portland. I ought to have noticed that here and there, along the banks coming up, almost on the river's level and exposed to inundation at each high water, you pass dairy farms, consisting of a shanty or tumble-down house, and a few anchors of rank and muddy pasture, where ague seems to sit brooding on the branches of the trees, whose trunks and limbs yet bear the traces of last season's flood. But now, for the juvenile but audacious Portland, who describes herself as the commercial metropolis of the Northwest. One considerable suburb, called East Portland, stands on the east bank of the Willamette, but the main part of the town is on the west bank, and now nearly fills all the level land between the river and the hills behind, which seem to be pushing at and resenting the intrusion of the streets along their sides. Extensions are taking place along the northern end, where a considerable stretch of low-lying land is yet available along the banks of the river, and also, to some extent, at the farther or southern end of the city. The building westward is mounting the hillsides, already dotted with the somewhat pretentious wooden houses of the more prosperous townspeople. To one who has seen real cities, it is but a little place, but some of its 21 or 22,000 inhabitants raise claims to greatness and even supremacy that makes it difficult to suppress a smile. In 35 years, the place has grown from a collection of log huts, set down as if by chance, to its present dimensions, and no doubt could go on growing as fast as Oregon developed, could the same conditions last. The city consists of near a dozen streets, running parallel with the Willamette, and about 23 at right angles. Front Street and First Street contain some brick buildings, remarkable for so very young a place. The former backs on the Willamette, and on it front the warehouses and wharves, against the backs of which the ships are moored. The latter contains nearly all the city's stores and shops of any consequence. The United States District and Circuit Court sit at Portland. The former is, and has been for several years, presided over by the Honorable Matthew P. Deddy. This gentleman's name will be long associated with the jurisprudence of Oregon, having been one of the original compilers of the Code and reporter of the decisions of the Supreme Court of the State, until, promoted to the bench of the United States Court, he has taken a high place as a conscientious and able judge. To him, also, Portland mainly owes that which I consider the chief ornament and pride of the city, rather than the ambitious but faulty structures in wood, stone, and iron on which most of the citizens glorify themselves. I mean the public library. This institution has its headquarters in spacious rooms over Messrs. Ladd and Tilton's bank. The shelves are filled with upwards of 10,000 well-selected books, and the process of addition is going on under the same careful oversight. Here, every evening are groups of readers, and it must be a source of constant satisfaction to the judge to have been the means of organizing and continuing the successful working of an institution which is affecting silent but untold good. Portland is also the residence of Bishop Morris, of the Episcopal Church. He has resided there for twelve years past, and to him the city is indebted for the St. Vincent's Hospital, where accidents are treated at all times, and which is open for receiving besides a certain number of sick persons. The bishop has also founded and kept going the Bishop Scott Grammar School. This is a high school for boys. Last year, it had 59 pupils and five teachers, and a sound and solid education is there given. St. Helen's Hall, the best girls' school in the state, was also founded by him. There were here 160 pupils and 12 teachers last year. Other churches exert themselves to occupy and hold prominent positions in the city, notably the Roman Catholics, whose archbishop, Seegers, resides in Portland 
and who have erected a large red brick cathedral. It is as yet unfinished, but a further effort by the Roman Catholics in the diocese is about to be made to complete and furnish it. There is a fair theater in the city. It is occupied now and again by a traveling troupe from San Francisco, generally consisting of a star and his or her supports of a more or less wooden consistency. The building of the Mechanics Fair, which is used for balls and concerts, one or two Masonic and Society's halls, the rooms of the several fire companies, and those of the Young Men's Christian Association complete the list. There are a good many expensive stores of all kinds, and all seem prosperous. The Chinese quarter is, of course, not so large and picturesque as in San Francisco, but it is equally well marked. A complete range of Chinese stores, with doctor's shops and theater, the usual lanterns hung out over the doors, and the common display of curious edibles. There are several substantial Chinese firms and business houses. One of their chief sources of revenue is the bringing over and hiring out the large numbers of Chinese laborers required for the railway works now in progress. The census disclosed 1,900 Chinamen as residents of Multnomah County. I suppose 1,800 of them were found in Portland. Four banks do a large general business, and there is also a savings bank. A mortgage company, having its headquarters in Scotland, at Dundee, takes up cheap money in Scotland and lends it out to great advantage in Oregon, at the rates prevalent here, with results satisfactory to its manager, Mr. William Reed, as well as to its stockholders. There are two ironworks, a large sash and door factory, a brewery, and a twine and rope factory, but beyond these, scarcely any manufacturing industry. The prosperity of the city, which has been very great during the last few years, is solely attributable to its character of Tollgate. Situated at the extreme northern boundary of the state, in a position which was not unsuitable when Oregon and Washington Territory were bound together, it is perfectly anomalous to suppose that the capital city of Oregon should have been there placed by deliberate intention. As matters now stand, it is the only port in Oregon, save Astoria, to which the large grain ships can come, and at which the deep-draft ocean-going steamers can take in and discharge their cargoes. And, very naturally, its businessmen seek to perpetuate that state of affairs, regardless of the growing interest of the great country which now pays tribute to their little town. It is not easy to forget how more than one of its leading citizens, when applied to to add their signatures to a petition to Congress, in aid of the removal of the reef partially obstructing Yaquina Bay, replied, Every dollar you get is so much taken directly from our pockets. A further adventitious help that Portland got was by being made the headquarters of the Oregon Steam Navigation Company, which brought to its wharves the produce of the Columbia River traffic, as well as that of the Willamette. It might be natural to bring to, and to leave at Portland wharves, the wheat of western Oregon, but there seems little sense in bringing grain down the Columbia and then up the Willamette to be deposited in Portland, thence to be transferred partly in ships, partly in barges and river steamers, to Astoria, where alone the loading of the ships could be completed. The present style of the Portland and Astoria newspapers is to make very light of the Columbia Bar. In fact, they boldly state that to hardly any port is so good an approach vouchsafed as to Portland. They instance London and Philadelphia, Glasgow and New Orleans, as parallel instances in position, and the Oregonian is never weary of singing the praises of their Tom Tiddler's ground of a city. But it has not always been so with them. The historian stated, on the 30th of January, 1880, that there were 30 vessels off the bar, unable to enter. The same paper, on the 23rd of March, 1880, published this item of news. Pilots on the bar all agree that, unless some measures are adopted for permanent improvement of the channel, it will not longer be considered safe for vessels to enter or cross out with more than 18 feet draft of water. The historian, in the same issue, also informed us that, 
Captain Flavel has been making personal inspections of bar soundings, and is himself fully satisfied that it is only a question of very brief time, so rapid and broadcast is the shoaling process, when it will be impossible for deep vessels to cross. The North Channel, along Sand Island from the head, is filling up as fast as does the South Channel. While the Oregonian told us as recently as December, 1880, that the gatherer with railroad iron for the Northern Pacific Railroad Company was compelled to lighter four times between Baker's Bay and Kalama at heavy expense. The Shandos, sailing from this port within the past two weeks, lightered 1,300 tons. The A.M. Simpson lightered 1,100 tons. And the last departure, the Edwin Reed, getting off on a winter rain flood, scraped over the shoals with all but 280 tons of her load, the lightest lighterage of a wooden vessel for many months. The report has gone forth that to reach Portland, a ship must be dragged up a hundred miles or more of river over four bad bars, and at the shipping season, lighterage at enormous cost is necessary. Naturally enough, we now have no large ships. End of chapter 22, part 1. Recorded by Laura Kumanov, San Francisco, January 30th, 2021. Chapter 22, Part 2 of Two Years in Oregon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonathan Miller. Two Years in Oregon by Wallace Nash. Chapter 22, Part 2. The abuses of the present system of shipping are many and great and all on the principle of making hay while the sun shines. Here, a shipmaster who published his experiences in October last. On the fourth day, we got two tugs and crossed the outer bar and anchored in Baker's Bay, where the ship had to be lightened to 20 feet and 6 inches draft before she could cross the inner bar and reach Astoria. This lighterage cost $2 per ton and had to be paid by the ship. As four other ships arrived about that time, which required lightering also, before they could proceed farther, we were detained at Baker's Bay for nine days, having the expense of a full crew on board all that time. The distance from outside of the outer bar to Astoria is about 14 miles, for which the towage is $500, pilotage $192, and that was in the middle of a beautiful day ship also using her own canvas and hawser. I believe this charge is almost equal to salvage. The pilots are hired by the owner of the tugs who collects the pilotage, paying the pilots $100 a month for their services. As the pilots have no boat of their own, they are obliged to go in the tugs, which are all owned by one man. I was just 14 days from the time I anchored off the bar till I reached the dock where I was to discharge cargo, and for towage and pilotage alone, from the bar to the dock, paid $1,009. Portland is the Oregon headquarters of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company, a corporation formed by the fertile genius of Mr. Henry Villard in June 1879 by the amalgamation of the Oregon Steamship Company, owning the ocean-going steamers between San Francisco and Portland, and the Oregon Steam Navigation Company, owning the river boats plying on the Columbia and Willamette. Here are the termini of the East and West Side Railroads, originally formed by Mr. Ben Holliday, a name very familiar to Oregon ears. But until this spring of 1881, owned and worked by the Committee of European Bondholders, into whose hands the lines in question fell by virtue of the securities they held. And in Portland also are the head offices in Oregon of the Scotch system of narrow-gauge railroads, now being constructed by means of Scotch capital attracted to the state 
by the successful working of the land mortgage company referred to above. It will be seen, therefore, that there are abundant reasons for predicting that a large portion of the business of Oregon will center in Portland for many years to come, at any rate. The more cause that Portland men should welcome the development of the other portions of the state, with which, in the future, profitable business is certain to arise. As new industries are started, existing interests widen and strengthen themselves, and new centers of population and business find their places in the growing state. Time will show whether the sanguine hopes of the Portland people that their city will hold the virtual monopoly of the trade of the Northwest are well-founded or not. There can, in my mind, be little doubt that she will have a very formidable rival in the city on the Puget Sound, which will spring up, as by magic, when the Northern Pacific Railroad there receives and discharges passengers and freight. It will be an evil day for Portland when the wharves at Tacoma find the grain ships alongside and the cars pouring in the grain of eastern Oregon and Washington Territory. And some little effect on her tolls will be produced when the Yaquina Bay is opened and the cars of the Oregon Pacific are there delivering the freight of middle and southern Oregon. Portlanders rely on what they call the concentration of capital to pull them through. They have yet to learn the sensitiveness of the movements of their divinity. How prone she is to follow the current of trade to its points of receipt and delivery. And should that day ever dawn, when figures show her supremacy to have departed, not one single sigh will escape these valley counties, which Portland has levied tribute on and done her best to keep in bondage till the end of time. Passing eastward from Portland up the Columbia in one of the large and comfortable boats of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company, a day's journey brings you to the Dalles. I have already mentioned how rapidly this town is growing, as the point of distribution for the greater portion of northeastern Oregon, and the point of reception for the vast quantities of grain, wool, hides, and other productions of that pastoral and agricultural county. Taking a Willamette River boat, notice, in passing the Oswego Iron Works, seven miles from Portland, and then the village of Milwaukee, with large and well-appointed nurseries, whence many of the orchards of the state have been supplied. The steamer will then stop at the wharf of Oregon City, just below the great falls of the Willamette. Notice the magnificent river throwing itself over the rocky ridge, which shows one or two black points of rock from amid the foam of the falls. See the lofty hills on either side, clad with vegetation to their very tops, while the little town is crowded on the narrow strip down by the river on the eastern side. What a water power is yet running to waste, though lumber mills, flour mills, and woolen mills take their tribute as it passes. On the west side are the locks. Here the steamer crosses the river from the city, and you get a pretty view of this, one of the earliest settled towns in the state. It dates from the Hudson Bay Company's rule, and the oldest inhabitant can tell you story after story of the early days when the meetings were held here, which virtually determined the allegiance of the infant state. Iron ore has been prospected in plenty in these hills above the town, but waits for development. Passing up the river, the next important place we meet is Salem, the capital of the state. The state capital stands on elevated ground about a mile back from the river, with a large green space in front, planted with ornamental trees and shrubs. The scene from the great windows at the back is really grand, Mount Jefferson being in full view and the line of the Cascades in ridge after ridge displayed in all their beauty. Fronting the Capitol buildings at the other side of the park are the courthouse and offices of Marion County, also a substantial and handsome pile. On the southern side of the capital stands the buildings of the Willamette University. The town of Salem is now growing. 
It has the advantage of a splendid water power called Mill Creek, which is turned to good account before it reaches the Willamette just below the city. On it are placed the pioneer oil mills where linseed oil and linseed cake are produced of excellent quality and moderate price. Also a large building now used both as an implement factory and as a flour mill. This has lately changed hands and it is too soon yet to speak of its success. Below this are placed the Salem flour mills of Kinney Brothers and Company. Their brand is recognized and approved in all of the markets of the world, as it ought to be if the best of wheat turned into the best of flour and its sale honestly and intelligently carried out can command success. The mills are fine buildings fitted with the most modern and powerful machinery and stand just on the edge of Willamette with a dock where the river steamers can deliver wheat and receive flour. I believe that this last fall of 1881, they converted 600,000 bushels of wheat into flour. A switch from the Oregon and California Railroad runs from the main line to the mills on the other side and is proving an immense convenience to the city generally, as well as to the mills. The steamboat pauses on its upward journey at Buena Vista to take in and deliver freight for the pottery there already extensive, and which, by the excellence of its productions, demonstrates that it only needs further capital and enlarged business relations to do an important share of the trade of the coast. The glaze on the ware is very good, made from a mineral earth found on the, in the bank of the Willamette at Corvallis. After passing the mouth of the Santiam, the most considerable tributary of the Willamette, we stop at Albany. This is one of the best situated and most progressive towns in the state. Although with a little less than 2,000 inhabitants at present, it has all the enterprise and go of a town in Europe of five times that number. There are here also three large flour mills, the brands of some of which are known and prized in Liverpool, to which port cargoes are frequently sent. Albany has a, a lumber mill, foundry, twine mill, and scutching mill, fruit drying works, sash and door factory, and soon will have woolen mills also. The making of the place is the water power of the Santium River, brought in a canal for 13 miles through the level prairie land, but rushing through the town and supplying the mills and factories with a flow and force of water sufficient for double as many works as at present use it. The town is supplied with water for domestic purposes from the same source of clearness and purity that is, is hard to equal. Albany has three newspapers, six churches, a very good collegiate school, and excellent common schools. It is a principal station on the Oregon and California Railroad and also an important station on the Oregon Pacific, now so rapidly building. And its point of crossing the Oregon and California and a junction for the branch line to Lebanon, away there under the slopes of the Cascades. Land in the neighborhood of the town and indeed throughout the level portions of Lynn County, ranging over an area of nearly 20 miles each way, is worth from $25 to $60 an acre. The last sale I heard of, of 132 acres, about five miles from the town, being at $39 an acre. The next town we come to is our own Corvallis, appropriately named as the heart of the valley. It is indeed fitly placed as the valley starting point, seaward of the Oregon Pacific Railroad, being on the direct line east and west between Yaquina Bay, the Mount Jefferson Pass through the Cascades, Prineville in eastern Oregon, Harney Lake and Valley, the Malheur River and Valley, and Boise City, the meeting place in the near future of diverse transcontinental lines. 
Corvallis has been too fully described in these pages to need further reference here. The commencement of energetic construction of the Oregon Pacific and the assurance of its early completion have given an increased business life to the place, which impresses the visitor strongly with the idea of rapid future growth. Continuing in our steamboat to the head of the Willamette navigation, we pass the little towns of Peoria and Harrisburg, and at last reach Eugene City. This, which is the chief town of Lane County, is blessed with a university, presided over by excellent professors, one of whom, Professor Condon, has name and fame as a geologist far beyond the limits of his county, and also of the state. I trust the time will soon come when the liberality of the legislature of Oregon will provide the funds necessary to enable Professor Condon to complete and publish the systematic geology and mineralogy of Oregon, the materials for which are already to a large extent in his possession, the result of years of careful study and journeyings over the state. Eugene City is a lively, pleasant little town, but has not yet attained any manufacturing or industrial development like some of the other towns in Oregon. This is to come. Leaving the river for the railroad, we journey up to Roseburg, the capital of Douglas County, and the southern terminus of the Oregon and California line. No town can be more prettily placed, really at the head of the great valley country, with the vast mountain forms behind frowning on the traveler who dares attempt to thread their passes. As I have said, the Douglas County people trust to get a railroad outlet from Roseburg down to the Coos. I hope they will succeed and so open to ocean transit the productions of a vast and fertile country. Turning north again as far as Corvallis, we may there take the West Side Railroad and journey along the west side of the Willamette Valley and River. The towns of Independence, Dalles, Sheridan, Amity, Lafayette, McMillanville, Forest Grove, and Hillsboro lie in the district between Corvallis and Portland. Each and all are thriving, but I can do no more than mention them, for I fear so short a reference will be considered scant courtesy to the active, pushing people who are laboring with such success at the development of Polk, Yam Hill, and Washington counties. The land is almost uniformly good. Large quantities are being yearly grubbed and put under the plow, and several of my recently arrived English friends prefer the undulating land and gentle slopes of this side of the valley to any other part of Oregon, and have proved their preference by their actions. Land in these counties varies from 10 to $20 an acre in price. I think I will close this somewhat tedious chapter by setting out the counties of Oregon, their population, and the statement of their taxable property furnished by the Secretary of State. Baker County, population 4,615, taxable property as of 1880, $931,139. Benton County, Population 6,403. Taxable property of 1880, 1,766,282. Clackamas County. Population 9,260. Taxable property 1,886,916. Clatsop County. Population 7,222. Taxable property 1,136,099. Columbia County. Population 2,042. Taxable property $305,283. Coos County. Population 4,834. Taxable property 832,000. $335. Curry County, population 1,208. Taxable property, 
$219,333. Douglas County, population 9,596. Taxable property, $2,248,985. Grants County, population 4,303. Taxable property, $1,088,097. Jackson County, population 8,154. Taxable property, $1,449,623. Josephine County, Population 2,485. Taxable property, $253,594. Lake County, population 2,804. Taxable property, $708,517. Lane County, population 9,411. Taxable property, $3,078,756. Lynn County, population 12,675, taxable property $4,334,479. Marion County, population 14,576, taxable property $3,983,173. Multnomah County, population 25,204. Taxable property, $11,511,058. Polk County, population 6,601. Taxable property, $1,751,211. Tillamook County, 970 population. Taxable property, 92,912. Umatilla County, Population, 9,607. Taxable property, 2,094,723. Union County, population, 6,650. Taxable property, 1,265,603. Wasco County, population, 11,120. Taxable property, 2 million. $873,645. Washington County, population 7,082, taxable property 2,137,630. Yam Hill County, population 7,945, taxable property values 2,547,833. Total of the state, population 174,767. Total taxable property values, 48,494,223 dollars. Increase over 1879, 2,071,406 dollars. The proportion of taxable property held by each man, woman, and child in Oregon is therefore $277.47. The population of the Valley Counties, properly so called, is 83,549. This leaves Portland and Multnomah County entirely out. The taxable property of these Valley Counties is $23,735,262. The population of the whole of eastern Oregon, east of the Cascades, is but 39099 The value of its taxable property is only $8,958,724. The population of that part of eastern and northeastern Oregon which is in any sense tributary to the Columbia or Snake Rivers, is 28180 The value of their taxable property is $6,256,547. The average taxable property of the population of the Valley counties is $282.68. That of the population of Eastern Oregon, 
$228.96. These figures will be seen to have an important hearing on the subject of the next chapter. End of chapter 22, part 2. Chapter 23, Part 1 of Two Years in Oregon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Henry. Two Years in Oregon by Wallace Nash. Chapter 23, Part 1. From all that has gone before, the deduction is plain that on the solution of the transportation question in the interests of the fixed and industrious population of the state depends absolutely the growth and prosperity of Oregon. Nature has done her part. The words of Messrs. George M. Pullman of Chicago and William Endicott, Jr. of Boston, in their report of August 1, 1880, to the stockholders of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company, will be echoed by every man who is now or has been in Oregon with eyes to see. They wrote as follows. Our observations afforded, in the first place, ample confirmation of all we had previously heard and read of the propitious climate, great attractions of scenery, and wonderful agricultural resources of western and eastern Oregon and eastern Washington Territory. We believe that in these respects, those regions are not surpassed, if equaled, by any other portion of the United States. It can indeed be safely said that nowhere else in this country do rich soil and mild climate combine to the same degree in ensuring such extraordinary results of almost every agricultural pursuit as regards quantity, quality, and regularity of yield. The striking evidence of past and present growth which we found everywhere forced at the same time the irresistible conclusion upon us that we were beholding but the beginning of the sure and rapid progress in population, productiveness, and prosperity, which will be witnessed in the immediate future within the vast stretch of country watered by the great river Columbia and its numerous tributaries. The reader of this book will, I think, admit that the facts herein detailed go far to justify the conclusions summed up in these few but carefully chosen words. How does this transportation question now stand, and what, if any, matters are in progress or contemplation to affect it? In the first place, the companies are all free to manage their own business in their own way. They charge what they like favor what persons and places they choose, and load on others burdens heavy to be borne. I have before indicated what was the purpose of the bill introduced in the legislature of 1880, to prevent discrimination by common carriers. The Oregonian commented on the loss of the measure in these terms. We present today the report of the hostile Senate committee on this bill, the report shows why the proposed measure was both an unjust and an impracticable one. It should be apparent to everyone that railways never can be operated in this way. The confusion and disorder would be endless. Besides, every railroad which is undertaken and constructed as an actual business enterprise is entitled to make fair earnings instead of being annoyed by straw railroads got up for speculative purposes, it ought to have protection from such annoyance. Oregon Railway and Navigation Company In further illustration of the working of the present system, I would instance the fact that from Corvallis to Portland for about a year, the freight on wheat by the river steamboats of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company has been one dollar a ton, and of this, 50 cents had to be paid for passing the locks at Oregon City. The rate immediately previous to this was three dollars and a half. This ridiculously low rate was put on in order to destroy the traffic of the east and west side railroads, and is in strong contrast with the rate from Corvallis to Junction City, some 20 miles up the river, where no such reasons existed 
and which stood through this period at about tenfold the one-dollar rate. No sooner did the president of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company think he had secured control of the two railroads than steps were prepared to quadruple the previous rate. The question of control stood adjourned, and the one-dollar rate was confirmed, but having seen reason to think his acquisition secure, the rates from Portland to Corvallis, 97 miles by railroad, both by railroads and steamboats, have just now, April 1881, been raised to six dollars per ton, a rate equal to that charged in the infancy of the business 20 years ago. The lion's share of the carrying business of the state is in the hands of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company, and with them are closely identified the hopes of the city of Portland. This company owns two of the steamers plying between Portland and San Francisco, the Oregon and the Columbia. With these two steamers, or with the George W. Elder as the predecessor of the Columbia, they carried from the 1st of July, 1879, to the 30th of June, 1880, 17,333 passengers and 101,661 tons of freight. The gross receipts were $636,888, the net profits $286,459. As we know from the published circular of Mr. Villard, the president, that the cost of the Columbia was $400,000, and the Oregon is a smaller and decidedly less expensive ship, the proportion of net earnings of the vessels in question to their total cost will be seen to be about enough to pay 10% per annum on their cost and to buy the vessels out and out in three years and a half. The fare from Portland to San Francisco, even while these earnings were being made, stood at $20 the first-class passenger. News has just arrived that these fares are to be raised to $30 a head, if the same rate of expense is maintained, as during last year, the earnings at the higher figure now put on will be increased by about $100,000, and enough will be realized to pay for the fleet in about two years and a half. With 25 steamboats, sternwheelers, navigating the Columbia and Willamette Rivers, and 12 barges and two scows, several of the boats being old and laid up in ordinary much of the time, reducing thus materially the fleet in real service, the company earned $1,992,836 gross and $1,101,766 net profit. If $50,000 is deducted for the earnings of the barges, it will be seen that the average net earnings of the 25 river steamers are positively $44,070 each. The fleet could be replaced for less than the sum of the net profit of one year. Like Oliver, asking for more, they are positively raising these freights also. Railroad Along the Columbia The railroad possessions of the company, for the year in question, consisted of but 48 miles, and of these the line from Walla Walla to Wallula on the Upper Columbia, a distance of about 30 miles, was the longest, the other two being short strips of portage railroad round the Cascades or rapids on the Columbia. The passengers carried were 12,588, the tons of freight 72,149, and the net profits $269,004 or $5,604 a mile. The company is engaged in constructing a line of railroad along the south bank of the Columbia, the portion from Celilo, the upper end of the rapids, at the lower end of which the town of the Dalles is situated, to Wallula, just over the Washington Territory border, a distance of 115 miles, is just completed. The line is being extended to the city of Portland. The works between the Dalles and the western end of the pass through the Cascade Mountains being of the most severe and expensive character. At least two tunnels, and mile after mile of blasting and cutting through solid rock, where the mountains tower perpendicular above, 
would inspire dismay in the soul of any ordinary railroad man. But the word has gone forth that the road has to follow what is facetiously called the pass of the Columbia through the Cascades, and doubtless it will be done. Several thousand Chinamen are at work. Steam drills are busy perforating the rocks. Scows have to be moored alongside in the river, there not being enough room for the track between mountain and water, while the perpendicular faces of the cliffs are being tormented and torn. And thus, about seventy miles of construction of this nature have to be got through. When completed, of course, the result will be at once to transfer nearly all of as many of the 117,000 passengers as traveled in the company's boats on the Columbia to the cars, and a vast quantity of the freight must follow the same route. But another factor is intended shortly to come into play. The Northern Pacific Railroad is vigorously at work, and in a year or two will compete with the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company for the Washington Territory and extreme eastern Oregon trade. The passengers and freight entrusted to the Northern Pacific Line will be carried from Wallula, the Columbia River point above referred to, to Tacoma on Puget Sound. By this route, a saving of 151 miles in actual distance will be effected, and the traffic will reach the deep and still waters of Puget Sound, far away from the troubles and stickings of the Willamette and Columbia mouths, and the delays, dangers, and expenses of the Columbia Bar. It is true that before this result is gained, the line must cross the Cascade Mountains, but it is well known that a pass at less than 3,400 feet exists, and the engineers have no doubt whatever that this piece of road will keep pace with the rest to the port. How to get control Mark now another feature in the case. The east and west side railroads on either side of the Willamette River compete with the boats of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company for the trade of the Willamette Valley. The railroads naturally divert the passenger traffic almost entirely and carry a large quantity of freight. They would carry more and earn a fair profit for their owners, the German and English bondholders, but instead of a fair competition, the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company, as I have said, put down the freights from Corvallis downward to Portland on grain to $1 per ton, of course an impossible rate for either river or railroad to profit by. Why is this? because what Mr. Villard calls the control of these railroads is vitally necessary to the future continuance of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company's stocks in their exalted dividends and consequent enormous market value. Therefore, it is sought now to destroy the earning powers of these railroads, to force the owners into succumbing to the policy of control. One more step. The Oregon Railway and Navigation Company owns practically no land. That is to say, it is interested speculatively in the rise of value in property in Portland by having invested a large sum, I believe $199,000, in the purchase of 484 acres of land in and near the city. But outside this and its railroad track, The company owns altogether about 3,055 acres of land in scattered pieces, only about 850 acres of which lie in Oregon, the rest in Washington Territory, and a bit or two in Idaho. We will not omit to mention its wharves at the various stopping places of the boats, as they represent the expenditure of a considerable sum. Once again, if anything at all is clear, it is that the inflated value of this company's securities depends solely on the continuance of their monopoly. I have shown that on the Columbia River this is threatened by the Northern Pacific, and also by themselves in effect by the substitution of the costly railroad line for the inexpensive boats, and the consequent devotion of both investments namely that in the boats and that in the railroad, to the same traffic, which the competition of the Northern Pacific is certain to reduce in gross volume. Now turn to the Willamette Valley traffic and scrutinize the position there. 
Not only is there the existing competition of the railroads, which is fatal so long as it is genuine, to the earning of large profits from the north and south traffic of the valley, both in passengers and goods, but here come in two competitors more. The Scotch narrow-gauge system also centers everything in Portland and has succeeded, after a hard fight with the city authorities, in securing a large tract of land for depot and terminal purposes. It had the audacity to claim a right-of-way right through the track purchased by the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company, and under the law of eminent domain, as it exists in Oregon, it would have got it, aye, and used it too, with but scant regard for the feelings of the high and mighty corporation which had marked it for their own. But a working arrangement was with much difficulty made, by which the Scotch line runs free of charge alongside the other, right through its land to the terminus of the narrow gauge. This Scotch line has put boats on the Willamette also. They ply between Ray's Landing, about 17 miles up the Willamette, and Portland. The narrow gauge also has an east side and a west side line through the Willamette Valley. The east side line runs north and south, a short distance from the foothills of the Cascades, and has now got as far as Brownsville, about 120 miles from Portland. Their west side line runs through the rich farming country in Polk County by Dallas to Sheridan and a junction with the western Oregon broad gauge nearby. This is also an ambitious company who are pushing surveys across the Cascade Range. The narrow-gauge system is yet by no means complete, but when it is, it will become at once a very dangerous rival both to the east and west side roads and also to the boats of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company on the Willamette. So seriously did Mr. Villard feel the impending danger that it is no secret in Oregon that a confidential agent was dispatched by him to Scotland to endeavor to put the Scotch investors out of conceit with their property, and failing that, he attempted to secure some of their stock so as to gain a footing inside their camp, but there also he failed. The Blind Pool Shortly before these pages were written occurred the episode of what is known in financial circles in America as the Blind Pool. Mr. Villard caused it to be known among his circle of followers that he desired the use of $8 million. According to statements made on his authority, he not only secured it, but in all 15 millions were offered him. Quietly and secretly, he used the eight millions in buying up stock of the Northern Pacific Railroad in the New York market. Nor did he show his hand until he had thus secured 27 millions par value of the stock of that road. When his great gun was thus loaded, he discharged it full at the head of Mr. Billings, the president of the Northern Pacific, and those directors who had loyally cooperated with him in the reorganization of the company and the redemption of its securities from the chaos into which they had fallen following the J. Cook failure. And the invader boldly claimed that he had secured the control of that company, too, and proposed to oust the president to install a representative of the blind pool. But an unexpected check was made. It seems that part of the reconstituted stock of the company, amounting to $18 million, was as yet in the treasury of the company, but was the property of diverse persons who had cooperated in or assented to the reconstruction. This being issued, as Mr. Billings and his friends claim, in fulfillment of engagements long since entered into, displaced the center of gravity and caused it to incline heavily towards the Billings section. A vociferous outcry was, of course, heard, the courts were appealed to, and the result of what promises to be a long and costly litigation remains to be seen. Even without the entrance on the field of the new forces I am about to describe, the position of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company appears to be a very perilous one. Under the chieftainship of Mr. Villard, who was no novice at the art of playing with railroad companies as counters in the game of beggar my neighbor, 
a vast amount of eastern capital was taken up by the aid of the enormous profits earned by the previously existing Oregon Steamship and Oregon Steam Navigation Company. Then followed naturally an era of really delusive prosperity while the expenditures of this capital in substituting the new lamps of costly railroads for the magical old lamps of sternwheel steamboats was going on. But in order to secure this capital, it was necessary to publish to the world the enormous profits the earlier companies were making. The effects were twofold and immediate. One was to open the eyes of the farmers of Oregon to the fact that they were paying for the transport to market of their crops sums utterly disproportionate to the cost and risk of the services rendered. And thus it was certain that, ere long, measures would be taken in the legislature of Oregon, similar in purport to those adopted in other states, to check and curb the power of discrimination, which was the engine used to force the traffic onto the boats and trains of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company. The measure to that end introduced in the session of the legislature of 1880 was, it is true, defeated by the strenuous efforts of the company, aided by their Portland friends. But that success was dearly bought, and the process was so patent as to awaken the farmers with whom the real power dwells in a fashion that will soon be felt. Yaquina Bay The other result, equally inevitable, was to call into active life plans long in preparation for constructing an east and west line across the state. Relying on Yaquina Bay as the outport, and on the trade of the Willamette Valley as the mainstay of the road. But the enterprise had other features to recommend it. The Willamette Valley and Coast Railroad Company had been originated four or five years back by the farmers of the valley to construct a railroad between Corvallis and Yaquina Bay. It had obtained a charter from the legislature giving it authority to extend its line across the state to the eastern boundary at a point directly en route to Boise City, Idaho. This had been long ago marked out as the probable limit where connection either with a branch from the Union Pacific Railroad or with some other road pushing westward to the ocean might be made. The Willamette Valley and Coast Railroad received in its charter from the state immunity from taxation for 20 years and also a grant of all the rich tide and overflowed lands in Benton County, amounting to probably upward of 100,000 acres. Not content with this, the framer of this scheme had obtained the right of purchase on the basis of value of land in eastern Oregon 10 years ago of the grant of lands in aid of the construction of the Willamette Valley and Cascade Mountains Military Wagon Road, amounting to 850,000 acres. A sketch of the history of this road has been given before in these pages, and the character of the country through which it runs. End of Chapter 23, Part 1 Recording by Jennifer Henry Chapter 23, Part 2 of Two Years in Oregon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Logan Lorenz. Two Years in Oregon by Wallace Nash. Chapter 23, Part 2. The vital force of the Oregon Pacific Company which was formed and brought before the world in the autumn of 1880 to complete and operate the Willamette Valley and Coast Railroad, lay in the advantage of position in its central line, cutting Oregon in half, and thereby attracting traffic to it from both sides, and also in the solid backing of about 950,000 acres of land, stretching across the state from east to west, and which was certain to rise fourfold, at least in value by the construction of the railroad through it. The first 130 miles of the road pass through Benton and Lynn counties, which together produce about one-half, and with the adjoining counties of Polk and Marion on the north and the county of Lane on the south, 
fully three-quarters of the wheat crop of Oregon. It was estimated by a committee formed in these counties, who investigated the subject thoroughly, that not less than 180,000 tons of grain and other freight to the amount of 50,000 tons or more would seek an outlet over this road from these valley counties on the basis of the crop of 1878. The subsequent increase in acreage under crops would give not less than 300,000 acres instead of 250,000, at a very moderate estimate. The inward freight may be taken at one half of the outward bound, thus giving 414,000 tons, which the new road would be called on to transport. These figures raised the ire of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company and some of its Portland friends, and their abuse called forth a reinvestigation of the whole subject, which resulted in thorough confirmation of the estimates. Oregon Pacific Railroad The Oregon Pacific proposed, as soon as open for business, to lower the $7 a ton, the previous average charge of the other company on Valley Freight to San Francisco, to $3.50, and, and the $24 for first-class passengers and $14 for emigrant passengers to one-half of those figures. And it showed a very large probable dividend on its capital, on those reduced figures. The reasonableness of this will be seen by reference to the enormous earnings of the other company. The whole question turned, of course, on the practicality of so improving the entrance to Yakina Bay that heavy-laden ships of deep draft could enter to deliver and receive cargo. The valley farmers and traders, to the number of 3,400, petitioned Congress to appropriate $240,000 for these works. Strenuous efforts in support of this petition at Washington in the session of 1880 sufficed to overcome the opposition of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company, and the prayer was granted in principle but only an extent of $40,000, after the fashion in such cases. But the careful surveys and investigations of the United States engineers, which were at once undertaken, justified the hopes of the people and of those interested in the railroad, and very early in 1881, the works for the improvement were begun. Application was made to Congress in the winter session of 1880-81 to to appropriate $200,000 more for the works but only $10,000 were granted, although the legislature of Oregon had, in their session of 1880, by formal resolution, unanimously supported the application for $200,000. But the farmers of the Valley Counties were at last roused to vigorous action, and, under the presidency of the Lynn County Grange and its officers, are raising a large fund by subscription to continue without interruption the harbor works until additional appropriations are made by Congress. The subscription will not only serve to keep the harbor works in vigorous progress, but demonstrates the subscribers' conviction of the success of the efforts made for the completion of the Oregon Pacific Railroad and their active and personal interest in such success. Probable Effects of Competition And now the full force of the figures given in the last chapter is seen. So far as the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company depends on Oregon for its support, it must come from counties the population of which is but 28,180, and the value of their taxable property in 1880 only $6,256,547, the proportion of property for each inhabitant being $228.96, or nearly 20% below the average for the state. The Oregon Pacific will draw its present support from the Valley Counties, with a population of 83,549, and taxable property of $23,735,262, each about fourfold greater. Their average property is $282.68 per head, or about 2% above the rate for the whole state. If it be argued that the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company bases its hopes for maintaining its high dividends on its enlarged capital on the development of eastern Oregon in population and productions, which is in rapid progress, I reply 
that the same considerations apply with vastly increased force to the districts served by the Oregon Pacific. The latter relies not only on the fertile lands on the western side of the Cascades, unequaled in the whole United States for attractiveness to immigrants of the better class, but it also asserts its undoubted claim to profit from the settlement of the broad stretch of country, also in eastern Oregon, through which its line runs in its eastward course. If stress is laid on the advantage of the established position of Portland for the headquarters of the one road, the scale kicks the beam when the 110 miles of towage and pilotage, the probable delays in the rivers, the certain dangers and difficulties at the Columbia Bar, are weighed against the saving of 221 miles in actual distance, and the short course of but three miles from the ocean to the wharves at Yakina. Tactics in Opposition If Mr. Villard has displayed his cleverness in laying hold of established profits and turning them to the enormous gain of himself and of those friends of his who have followed his lead, I can here do but partial justice to the foresight and energy of Colonel T. Edgerton Hogg, whose clear judgment realized the necessity and the many advantages of the Yakina route ten years ago, who has fought through unnumbered difficulties and a bitter and envenomed opposition toward its attainment, and who has secured, in so doing, the hearty support of the backbone and sinew of Oregon life, which trust to the Oregon Pacific to set free the commerce of the state. Let it not be supposed that the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company is foredoomed to failure, or to immediately explode and go out like a rocket. According to my ideas, it may have a moderately prosperous future, bringing down to Portland a certain quantity of freight and passengers from the upper country and an increasing quantity as that country develops. But to suppose that on its enlarged capital it will be allowed to go on earning dividends at this same preposterous rate as heretofore its boats have made for it is to insult the common sense alike of the Oregon farmer and of the capitalist looking now more eagerly than ever for profitable and safe investment. One other point deserves attention. The Oregon Railway and Navigation Company owns practically no land, except its building land speculation in Portland. Therefore, when these competing lines come into play, and traffic rates are consequently reduced over all the state, its dividend-producing power is gone. The other lines can follow it down and down in any war of rates, so far as the Oregon Railway and Navigation Lines see fit to venture. Such tactics would be absolute madness in California, as by its new constitution, rates once lowered cannot be raised again. But suppose the war of rates is begun in Oregon. The Northern Pacific, when completed according to law, will save 151 miles in distance and deliver freight and passengers at deep water on Puget Sound. The narrow gauge roads and boats together can carry more cheaply than the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company. The Valley Standard Gauge Railroads and the Oregon Pacific share with the Northern Pacific this tremendous advantage that every dollar they lose on transportation is only invested at enormous profit in the rise in value of their lands. It is the cost of transportation that keeps down value on their lands. Lower this, and the land rises at once. Nor is it to be supposed for an instant that the same tactics by which it has been attempted to prevent, hamper, or delay the building of the Oregon Pacific Railroad will long succeed. Shortly after the prospectus of that railroad was issued, there appeared in the Oregonian of Portland three columns of abuse over the signature of examiner. The writer described himself as a citizen of Oregon, anxious to avoid delusion and disaster to the eastern public. The whole was telegraphed or mailed long in advance back to New York and appeared in a garbled and still more contemptible form as a circular, professing to be reprinted from the Oregonian, as if from the editor's chair of that paper. New York was flooded with the copies. Fortunately, it was easy enough to repel the attack, since the chief points were that the eastern Oregon lands were worthless, 
and the statements of the Willamette Valley trade exaggerated. And on both points, ample, even overwhelming evidence was at hand. The Cascade Mountains Road Then, by what hidden influences, it is of course impossible to say, the Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Schurz, was set in motion on the allegation that the Cascade Mountains Road had never been made, and that consequently the United States had been imposed upon 14 years ago when Congress granted the lands to the state of Oregon, and that state defrauded in turn 10 years ago when, on certificates of due completion satisfactory to the then officials of the state, the lands were duly confirmed to the Wagon Road Company. Thereupon, without inquiry as to the facts from the state officials of Oregon or from the road company or their representatives who had all the evidence in their possession, without one word of notice to any of the parties concerned, a man named Prosser, then residing at Seattle and occupied in repressing unwarranted timber cutting on government lands in that neighborhood, was dispatched to professedly examine into the condition of things. His journey, the narrative of his duplicity, of his inducing the president of the road company, in the innocence of his heart, to fit him out and to lend him all the money for his expenses, of his return and interviews with the citizens of Albany, of his subsequent report that no road existed where upward of 5,000 wagons and innumerable droves of cattle and of passengers on foot and horseback had passed without incident for ten years, of his allegations of the trivial cost of the works, met by the evidence of the outlay of about $100,000 on the construction and repairs of the road, of the storm of indignation which swept through Lynn County and found expression wherever the facts were known. All these things form an amusing chapter in the history of this transaction. The Congressional Committee, to whom the matter was referred, reported, as might be expected, that Congress had no jurisdiction, that so far as they could see, the present owners, being innocent purchasers, had good title to the lands, and that, if there were to be any attempt made to disturb them, it must be a judicial and not a legislative matter. Meanwhile, an action of ejectment had been brought by the purchasers from the road company of the land grant in the United States District Court at Portland against a squatter on the land, whose letters of old dated the commissioner of the land office had been made the pretext for the course taken by the Secretary of the Interior. Every opportunity was given for raising in court the question of no road, but the defendant dared not accept the challenge, and Judge Deedy rendered judgment for the owners of the land grant, and so settled the question for good and all, so far as I can see. His judgment was masterly and exhaustive, and I should think would convince any candid mind. Thus ends this act in the drama, with the position of the Oregon Pacific confirmed at every point, and the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company, with a very pretty quarrel on their hands with the Northern Pacific, and an impending competition, at which the farmers of the state rejoice. And so the transportation question in Oregon is in a fair way to be settled in a manner consonant with justice and honesty, so that produce will be charged only what is commensurate in fair measure, with the cost and risk of the service rendered, and not in the opposite direction of what the producer can bear. The Yakina Improvements Before I close this subject, let me describe very shortly the principle and method of the harbor improvements at Yakina. The problem is this. In the harbor is a sheet of tidal water running up more than 20 miles inland, and in the bay or harbor proper, expanding into a width of about three miles. To the tidal water has to be added that brought down by the Yakina River and its tributaries in a course of 50 miles or thereabout. The deep water channel to the ocean through which this inflow and outflow are repeated twice every 24 hours is deep and narrow, and the current very swift. Thus, this channel of a quarter of a mile wide between the headlands on either side of the mouth does not vary appreciably in width or depth, and requires no attention. Just where the mouth opens to the ocean is the reef of soft sandstone rock, 
rising in intervals of separate rocks to within 10 or 11 feet of low water mark. That is to say, each of the three channels through the reef, north, middle, and south, gives this depth of water. But here the water, which has kept clear and deep the channel of a quarter of a mile wide or thereabout, expands to a width of about two miles. Consequently, the current is not sufficiently strong in any one of the three channels to prevent the piling of the sand against the rock outside and in, in a gentle rise from the forty-foot depth outside to the height of the rocky reef, and similarly from the thirty feet inside the reef. The engineers propose, by a jetty from the south beach to a group of rocks forming the south side of the middle channel, to extend the narrow deep channel inside, and the consequent force of concentrated tidal and river water up to the rocky reef itself. They judge that the tidal force is ample to scour away clean all the sand deposited both in and outside the reef. They propose, then, to blast away the rock itself from the middle channel, which, as the obstruction is both soft and narrow, will be neither a difficult nor costly operation and they intend thus to open to the commerce of the world the calm and deep waters of the harbor, which will suffice to receive all the fleet of vessels trading to this coast. The construction of the jetty is proceeding rapidly by means of large mattresses of brushwood sunk in the destined position, loaded with rock and attracting and retaining the sand, and covered in, when the needed breadth and height are gained, with larger rocks brought down from a quarry of hard stone about eight miles up the harbor. No one who, like the present writer, has often tried to stem the tidal current sweeping out to sea, can doubt the force and velocity it will bring to bear, and no one familiar with Yakina doubts the anticipated success of the improvement. Once gained, it will be permanent, and then Half an hour will suffice to tug the arriving vessel from the deep waters of the Pacific to her station alongside her wharf, and the same time will dispatch her, fully loaded, on her voyage. To sum up this matter, at present a very large portion of the profits of farming and of other industries in Oregon goes into the pockets of the transportation company. The rates of freight bear no proportion to the benefits obtained but are fixed simply on the principle of sitting down to pencil out a list to see how much the farmers can possibly pay. If this state of things were to be indefinitely perpetuated, the outlook would be dreary. That a radical change is impending is to me clear. The country is too rich in productive powers, the citizens are too fully awake to the needs of their position. The knowledge of what Oregon is and what she wants is too widely spread, and the president of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company has trumpeted forth the enormous profits of his corporation too loudly for the failure of the efforts now in progress to introduce competition in the carrying trade, so that I, for one, am at rest as to the result. Oregon will take her own part in the general movement now current throughout the United States, to regulate, if not to curtail, the powers of the corporations. But I have confidence in the steady and peaceful character of her population not to carry this matter here to extremes, which might unduly burden associated capital, and check the flow of its full current to our state. End of chapter 23, part 2《Chapter 24 of Two Years in Oregon》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Logan Lorenz Two Years in Oregon by Wallace Nash Chapter 24 The question most often asked and most difficult to answer is, do you advise me to come to Oregon? It is easy to say who should not come. We want no waifs and strays of civilization, enervated with excesses or depressed with failure. Men who can find no niche for themselves, who have neither the habit, the disposition, nor the education for work. We want none of those youngsters who have tried this, have failed in that, until their friends say in disgust, 
Oh, ship them to Oregon and let them take their chances. We desire no younger sons of English or Eastern parents without energy or capital to start them. High birth, aristocratic connections, we value not at all, unless they carry with them the sense of responsibility to honored forefathers, the determination that the stigma of failure shall not stain a proud name. Nor do we desire those young men whose first thought is, how shall we amuse ourselves, and whose first aim is the cricket or baseball or lawn tennis ground, and whose chief luggage is bat, fishing rod, and shotgun. And, on the other hand, we do not want those who, having qualified themselves as they suppose, for life in Oregon by six months or a year with some scientific farmer, consider that they know everything, despise instruction, neglect advice, are wiser than their elders, and then throw up in disgust as soon as they find that they have sunk their money, that their theories will not work, and that they must here as elsewhere begin at the beginning. Nor do we propose, and we are certain it is in no way necessary, to charge newcomers an initiation fee of $250, or any other sum, for the privilege of joining our society in Oregon, and profiting by our experience. And, as I began by saying, the English who have come here have established no colony in the usual sense, set up no separate society, and claim no common corporate life. Who should come? Society we have, association we have, common amusements and pursuits we have, but in all these we invite our American neighbors to take their part and see no reason to regret our course. True it is that the costume of knickerbockers and gaiters and heather suit and pot hat is a very common object in our town, and that we meet in considerable force at the Episcopal Church on Sunday to join in the familiar service. But we adhere to our original plan that the newcomer shall settle where he pleases in these counties, shall have the best advice we can bestow in the choice of land, the purchase of stock and implements, and of the other necessaries for a farmer's start in life and shall have this free of charge. We offer the right hand of friendship. We will do our part to keep up association and kindly relations of all kinds. But we are more anxious that Oregon should be built up by the gradual incoming of men of serious purpose, possessed of moderate capital, who shall disperse over the face of the country as they would at home, and strengthen the state by the force of attraction, each will exercise over the friends and acquaintances he has left behind. Then we are to create here a bit of interjected foreign life. Therefore, let the farmer, above all, tried and worried at home by fickle seasons, heavy rent, burdensome tithe and taxes, labor troubles, low prices, and gradually fading capital, let him bring his wife and children and come his few hundred pounds will make a good many dollars, and he will be amazed to find himself owning productive land for about the sum he would have paid for two years' rent at home. If his means do not permit him to pay down the whole purchase price, he is one of the very few who can be safely advised to begin to some extent in debt. For, remember, Land in Oregon is expected to pay for itself from its own productions in five years' time. Even if the newcomer has had no previous practical experience, that not need of itself deter him. One of our best farmers told me the other day that when he began, he did not know which end of the plow went first. But in such case, the wisest thing is either to hire himself out to work for an Oregonian farmer for at any rate, a few months, or if he takes an opportunity of buying land for himself, let him reverse the operation and hire an Oregonian to work for him for a time. I read a short article in the Portland Evening Telegram the other day, which seemed to me very much in point, so I shall quote it. Seven years ago, two men, dissatisfied with the sluggishness with which their fortunes grew in Portland, determined to better their condition. The wonderful resources of the Willamette Valley as an agricultural country attracted one of them to Washington County, where he purchased a farm and stocked it with teams and farming implements and started on his road to independence and wealth. He told his neighbors, 
who had been in the farming business for years, that he proposed to show them how to succeed. He was industrious. He studied the books on farming and pursued his occupation on scientific principles, joined the Grangers, became an active member of farmers' clubs, was bitter in his denunciation of monopolies. Disliking the looks of the old-fashioned worm fence, he divided his fields by building nice plank partitions, and even asked permission of an old fogey neighbor to build the whole of a partition fence of plank, that the old one might not offend his fastidious taste. Here was mistake number one. The rail fence answered the purpose well enough, and he ought to have avoided the expense of the costlier one at least until a new one was necessary. He was from Indiana and thought corn a good crop to grow, so he prepared ten acres of his best land and planted them to corn. The squirrels came and took it all up. He replanted, and again the squirrels took the seed before it sprouted. He planted it once more and succeeded in getting a small crop of poor corn which did not mature, and it profited him nothing. Quoted Experiences This was another blunder, as any man who had made any inquiry ought to have known, that the raising of corn in this valley was never a paying business. A small patch of roasting ears for family use is all any wise farmer will ever attempt to raise. Again, our progressive farmer had been so impressed with the idea that the climate of Oregon was an exceedingly mild one that he thought his apples and potatoes were in no danger of freezing. So he put his apples upstairs and left his potatoes uncovered. Consequently, they were all frozen and lost. This was an inexcusable blunder for any man who would look at a map and see that he was located above the 45th degree of latitude should have known that any winter was liable to be cold enough to freeze unprotected fruits and vegetables. Our friend became discouraged and gave more attention to wheat, but found that he could not raise that commodity for less than 75 cents a bushel, although other farmers have asserted that the cost did not exceed 50 cents. With his experience of seven years farming in Oregon, he is perfectly satisfied that it will not pay, and hence he is back in Portland, intending to stay. The corn, apple, and potato business fixed him as far as farming is concerned, though he ought to have known that his course in regard to them would have resulted just as it did. Our second young man did not like the slowness of farming as a means of getting rich, so he put his money in sheep and took up a ranch in Wasco County. For a few years, he was encouraged. As the grass grew, his stock increased. The winters were mild, and wool brought a good price. He raised some feed, and for three years had no use for it, as the sheep made their own living off the range. He thought, when the cold snap set in last winter, that he had enough feed to last through any winter that could reasonably be expected. But the cold winds continued to blow, the snow fell and froze, and continued to fall and freeze. Two months passed. His feed was exhausted, and his sheep began to die. Out of 4,300 head, 3,000 died, and though a neighbor who started in with about the same number had only six head left, our young friend thought his own condition bad enough, and so concluded to quit the business and come back to Portland. He says a man can take a thousand head of sheep, build sheds, provide food, and have a sure thing to clear a few hundred dollars every year, but he did not want that kind of a sure thing. He made the mistake of him who makes haste to be rich, and hence he retires from the contest on that line no better off than when he started in. Both these men are now in Portland, and each is hopelessly disgusted with the attempt he has made. One thinks that farming in Oregon will never pay, though there are hundreds of farmers all over the state who started with less than he did and are now well situated and independent. The other thinks the whole of eastern Oregon, so-called, a failure, though he virtually admits that his lack of providence and his desire to make a large sum of money in a short time were the causes of his losses. Since we have been in Oregon, we have seen several cases like these examples. Let the intending emigrant weigh this well, that farming in the Willamette Valley is not the road to large fortune, though it is to comfort and prosperity. Cost and Ways of Coming Let no man, 
brought up in a comfortable eastern home, come to Oregon to farm, unless he can be assured that at the end of a year or two's probation and apprenticeship, he can have provided for him some small sum of money, enough for a start on his own land. The life of the agricultural laborer in almost every farmer's family here is a very hard and uncomfortable one. The lodging is rough. The living, though plentiful, is often coarse. The hours of labor very long, and the employments on the farm miscellaneous indeed. The better thing is for two friends or relatives to come together. They may separate for their apprenticeship, but their purchase may easily be made together. And, indeed, out here, two are better than one. And now for some hints as to the ways of coming, and what should and should not be brought. For the English emigrant, there is a large choice. He may come by any of the New York lines, and thence across the continent to San Francisco, and on by steamer to Portland. If he comes first class the route, he will find the expense nearly sixty pounds sterling, or about three hundred dollars. By choosing the cheaper cabin on the steamer, and reconciling himself to doing without the comforts of the Pullman car, and economizing in meals on the journey across by providing himself with a provision basket to be replenished at intervals, he may save about fifteen pounds, or seventy-five dollars. The time is short. Three weeks will bring him from Liverpool to Oregon, unless he delays needlessly in New York, Chicago, or San Francisco. In New York, let him beware of cabs or carriages. He is likely to be charged five dollars for a ride he will get in London for one shilling. The proper course is for him, after his baggage has passed the custom house, to entrust it to a transfer agent, who will have it conveyed to the hotel, and the emigrant can take the elevated railway or get a tramcar ride for a few cents. The same course should be followed on leaving the hotel for the railway terminus to come west. So far as I know, he can make no mistake in following his fancy in choosing his route. The Erie, or the New York Central, will carry him to Chicago, by way of Buffalo and Niagara. And, if any pause on the journey at all is made, let the opportunity be seized of seeing the most glorious of waterfalls, the remembrance of which will never die. The Baltimore and Ohio passes through Maryland and West Virginia, and the Pennsylvania Railroad, through New Jersey and Pennsylvania, and each shows him some of the finest scenery on the Atlantic Slope. From Chicago, he will have a choice again. There is no difference in cost, time, or comfort between the Chicago and Northwestern, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, and the Chicago and Rock Island. I have traveled by all three. Perhaps the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy runs through the most interesting scenery. Up to Omaha, the first-class traveler is allowed 150 pounds of baggage free, and so far it will be properly handled and cared for by the baggagemen. Baggage smashing. At Omaha, things change for the worse. Only 100 pounds of baggage is allowed by the Union Pacific and Central Pacific roads, and on all excess, the rate to San Francisco is 15 cents a pound. And if the traveler has any regard for his possessions, let him see to it that they are closely packed in the very strongest and roughest trunks that he can procure. Oh, those baggage smashers at Omaha. When we crossed last, I stood by to see a baggage car brought up alongside the stone platform, piled with trunks and other baggage to the roof, the doors thrown open, and the contents literally tumbled out pell-mell. Trunks were smashed open, locks broken, straps burst, contents ruined, and the baggage men seemed to take a horrid pleasure in tilting heavy trunks onto their corners, and so bundling them across at a rapid rate to the other car, dislocation of the strongest joints was the result. If the passenger be incautious enough to burden himself with the needless weight from Omaha, he should dispatch it to San Francisco by freight train addressed to his hotel, the rates so moderated that he will not have the chagrin of paying to the railroad companies about as much as most of his baggage is worth. Another route from England is by Southampton and Panama to San Francisco. The charge for a first-class passage is 50 pounds, 
and the traveler will not be bothered about his baggage, save on the Isthmus Railway. He may lose no time in catching the Pacific Mail Steamer on the Pacific side, but he is more likely to have three or four days to wait at Panama, in a town where there is nothing to see or do, and where he will be charged not less than three dollars a day at the hotel. The lovely scenery and gorgeous vegetation of the tropics will be a pleasant picture in memory, whatever drawbacks the five weeks occupied on this route may discover. San Francisco is the city of comfortable and moderately charging hotels. The most expensive are the Palace and the Baldwin. The Lick House and the Russ House are comfortable and more moderate, and the International is cheap but comfortable. From San Francisco to Portland, the steamers Oregon, Columbia, or State of California sail every five days and are each safe, speedy, and excellent boats. The cost of the journey is $20, and the time usually three days or more, including a detention of some hours at Astoria. As soon as the Yakina route is opened, it is expected that this time will be reduced by one half. And now, what should the emigrant bring to Oregon? So far as household furniture and fittings are concerned, the best and cheapest way is to send them by Royal Mail from Southampton by way of Panama. The freight was four pounds ten shillings per ton of forty cubic feet. I do not know if any change has been made. It is wise for any family to bring bedding, but not beds. Knives and forks and electroplate, books, pictures, and the little ornaments and trifles which go so far to transfer the home feeling to whatever room they may at once furnish and adorn. And do not forget the crockery. It is foolish to bring furniture, pianos, or such heavy and cumbersome property. All these used articles will come in duty-free. If they are sent to San Francisco direct from England, they will have to be examined at the custom house there. The traveler will find it a great waste of time and temper to pass his goods through the custom house himself. There are many respectable agents whose trifling fee is well spent in getting their services for this work. As for clothes, new clothes will be charged with a duty of 60% of their value and cause trouble also. Worn clothes and boots come in duty-free. The strongest and most durable woolen garments are those best adapted for the Oregon climate. English ankle boots are treasures not to be obtained for love or money in Oregon. The field boot of porpoise skin will be indefinitely valuable in our muddy winters, but such are too hot for summer wear. English saddlery should all be left at home. If the emigrant is the happy owner of a good breech loader, let him bring it, with as many of Ely's green cases as he can pack. Ammunition is expensive here. English rifles are a nuisance. The Winchester, Sharp, or Ballard, I think superior to any sporting rifles we have, as much so as the American shotguns are inferior to the English makers. Attractions which Oregon offers. Let us see, then, in a few words, why we expect that immigrants will continue to arrive. What are the attractions which Oregon offers? 1 a healthy and temperate climate, whether residence in the Willamette Valley or in southern or eastern Oregon is chosen. 2. A fertile and not exhausted soil, adapted to the continuous raising of all cereals, to the growth of the best kinds of pasture, and to the ripening of all temperate fruits in profusion and excellence. 3 a climate and range unusually suited to cattle, sheep, and horses of the best breeds. 4. The ocean boundary on the west, giving free access to shipping for the cheap transport of all productions. 5. Mineral wealth of almost every description, most of which is yet unworked. 6. Industrial openings of many kinds with special facilities by way of abundant water power. 7. Beautiful scenery, whatever portion of the state may be selected by the newcomer. 
8. Sport and pastime in moderation, with a notable absence of dangerous animals and reptiles and noxious insects. 9. A modern and liberal constitution, affording special advantages and securities to foreigners and aliens. 10. A quiet and orderly population, ready to welcome strangers. 11. Good facilities for education, remarkable in so young a country. 12. A railroad and river system of transportation, only now in process of development, and which is certain to affect a great rise in the value of lands. And now my work is done. I have endeavored to give, in as concise and short a form as I could contrive, a faithful picture of life as it is in Oregon today. I have extenuated nothing, nor set down aught in malice. If, in reviewing what I have written, I feel conscious of a special weakness, it is that I have brought too strongly into view the difficulties the immigrant will have to encounter for I feel sure that no one, on full knowledge, will accuse me of drawing in too fair and flattering colors the attractions of our beautiful state. May Oregon flourish by receiving constant additions to her vigorous and industrious people, whose efforts, in scarcely any other place in the wide world, so certain of a due return, may make her waste places plain, and cause her wildernesses to rejoice and blossom as the rose. End of chapter 24。Appendix of Two Years in Oregon。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Two Years in Oregon by Wallace Nash Appendix Since the foregoing pages were finished, a period of six months has passed. Nothing has transpired which should affect the opinions formed and expressed by the author in favor of the attractions which Oregon offers to the energetic and industrious. The past half-year has been one of successful development for the state as a whole. A bountiful harvest, which has been vouchsafed to Oregon, while many eastern states and many European countries have been to mourn because of drought or excessive rain and consequent scarcity, has again proved how highly favored by position and climate is this western nook. And now, in the early days of October, we have had a week's rain to soften the clods and prepare the ground for tillage. But the sun of the Indian summer is shining with soft brilliancy, and we look for crisp nights and mornings and lovely days, for from six to ten weeks to come. During the six months, Eastern Capital has been prodigally turned into Oregon and Washington Territory by Mr. H. Villard and his associates. New lines of railway, designed as feeders to the Columbia River route, are being pushed to completion regardless of cost, while the trunk line along the side of the Columbia River is being still urged forward by the United Forces of over 3,000 Chinamen and all the white laborers that can be picked up. Time alone will show how far a line which winds and twists along the banks of the mighty Columbia in devious curves, overhung by mountain sides loaded with loose rocks at the mercy of every winter's storms, can be trusted to carry the enormous traffic predicted for it. And granted that this slender reed has the necessary strength at what kind of port is the hoped-for mass of grain for export to be delivered? The following article appeared in the Daily Oregonian of Portland on the 10th of this last September. The newspaper in question claims to be the leading journal of the state, and is in fact the only one publishing full daily telegraphic dispatches. It is also the organ of the Villard interest, and it may be taken that it is not likely to overstate the disadvantages attaching to the city of its publication. THE COST OF NEGLECT The water in the rivers between Portland and the ocean is at about the usual September stage, but owing to the absence of any means whatever of dredging the bars, the depth at three or four shoal places is less than in former seasons. Steamers drawing seventeen or even seventeen and a half feet come up by ploughing through a few inches of mud at certain points. 
but ships have not the force to go through nor in many instances the iron bottoms to stand the rub it is not safe to load a vessel which must pass down the river more than sixteen feet the result is that grain ships can only be partly loaded here and must take a large proportion of their cargoes down the river the american ship palmyra went down thursday with nine hundred tons of a total wheat cargo of twenty two thousand two hundred the bulk of her load thirteen hundred tons must be carried down by barges and taken in at baker's bay the zamora now taking wheat here can only be half loaded at her portland dock lightridge costs one hundred twenty five dollars per short ton or six cents per centile thus the palmyra must pay one thousand six hundred twenty five dollars extra because the river is not properly dredged the average of the lighterage this season will be about three cents per centil on all wheat that goes out of the columbia river it is not far from the fact that although from sixty to sixty five shillings is a well-paying freight for ships from portland to the united kingdom and although abundance of sailing ships are available from the substitution of steamers in so many parts of the world yet the actual freight charged has ranged from eighty to eighty-five shillings this resulting from a combination of causes of which the charges for pilotage towage and lighterage are among the chief of course all these charges come out of the pocket of the producer and unless some radical change can be effected there is no apparent reason why these sums should not be accumulated to such a height as to place the valley farmer on the level of his eastern oregon and eastern washington territory neighbor who does not realize for his wheat much over thirty-five cents a bushel on an average market price of seventy-five cents nor would there be much hope of a reduction in the inland transportation charges were not matters to progress as they have been doing during the past six months everything pointed toward the centralization of the control of every railroad and steamboat line in this state and the adjacent territory in the hands of the oregon railway and navigation company presided over by mr villard the narrow-gauge system of railroads in this valley owned and operated by the scotch company with headquarters at dundee was six months back the sole hope of the valley farmers as an honest competitor with its huge rival but a few months ago announcement was made that mr villard had secured the scotch company by a series of astute operations in scotland and now under the ninety-nine years lease which he obtained the narrow gauge company has ceased its independent existence and its traffic is being assimilated as to rates with that of its former competitor while it is so conducted as to stifle its growth as a separate organization and throw all its vitality into the other roads but the anticipations expressed in the earlier pages of this book of an active rivalry to the oregon railway a navigation company through the oregon pacific railroad and its outlet at Wakina bay are being realized as rapidly as men and money can do it early in july last the news came through the wires that the financial battle had been won by colonel hogg and that construction was to be pushed forward immediately short as the time is much has been done and more is being done engineering parties were organized and fitted out and their work is nearly complete in all its parts a good line of easy grades is located through from corvallis to Wakina bay presenting no extraordinary difficulties of construction on this as i write a large force of both white and chinese labor is employed with the full expectation that the line will be surveyed built equipped and running within four or five months from the time the first spadeful of earth was dug difficulties in starting a great enterprises like the oregon pacific railroad of course abound but so far have been successfully met meanwhile the good will of the valley farmers has been maintained throughout and the new road will open with abundance of customers therefore all interested in the undertaking are well satisfied with the prospect of having to operate a line which shall save the valley farmers two hundred and twenty-one miles in actual distance and save them half the present charges for transportation between the valley and san francisco and which gives also an early prospect of ocean-going ships loading direct from an oregon port with wharves within three miles from the ocean for the european or eastern market it does not seem then an unreasonable augury that the day of exorbitant freights excessive pilotage and towage charges half cargo lighterage and also of traffic discrimination will have passed away forever so far as oregon is concerned 
when the Oregon Pacific is opened. And I think every reader of this book will admit that it is a matter of just pride to see projects formed years back and adhered to through much evil speaking, slander, and belittling come to their full strength and fulfillment. The last time I visited Joaquina Bay was during the closing days of September. The afternoon sun shone on the little dancing waves as we rowed across from Newport to the South Beach, where the harbor works are going on. A heavy equinoctial storm had raged for two days before, and it would have been no surprise had the incomplete works suffered. But we found the men busily employed in piling large blocks of rock on the mattresses made of large long bundles of brushwood, secured with cords and deposited carefully in the line of the breakwater. Many of the hands were Indians, who were working very intelligently and quickly under the direction of our old friend Kit Abbey. No damage whatever had been done, but on the contrary, the storm had piled the sand in even layers, five or six feet deep, on each side of the breakwater, solidifying and strengthening the work. Already the nearest channel, nearest to the beach, which had robbed the main channel of some of the tidal water, had been permanently closed and the increase of the tidal in and outflow thus caused had proved to the satisfaction of the united states engineer officer in charge the correctness of the theory on which the works were designed so that all tends in the one direction of opening this harbor on which so many hopes are fixed to ocean-going ships of deep draft fortunately the facts are being daily ascertained tabulated and certified by the independent authority of the united states engineers they have minute surveys of the channel, and the changes operated by the new breakwater will be observed and recorded. Thus, as soon as the time comes to invite the shipping sailing to the northwest coast to enter the port, there will be no further room for question as to the depth of water and ease of access. But the fact will be so patent and plain to the world that no one need be longer blinded by the persistent misrepresentations of interested parties. The effect of opening the Oregon Pacific Railroad, which in two or at most three years from now will meet at our near Boise City, Idaho, the lines rapidly pushing westward to that point will be manifold. First, it will open the new port at Joaquina to commerce and so give the Willamette Valley its independent outlet, unaffected by terror dealing bars, winter ice, and exorbitant charges. Second, it will be in its eastward progress open up to the settlement and broad belt of fertile and well-watered country, at present well-nigh untenanted. Third, it will operate as a check to the pretensions of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company to entire monopoly of the transportation of the state and its boasted consequent ability to fix fares and freights at its own sweet will. End of Appendix End of Two Years in Oregon by Wallace Nash